Folks, you turn on the daily news and it is equal to horrible things, isn't it? Almost wants you, wants to make you just turn off the news. Because what we read about are this, extreme political division in our world today. We read about rioting and killing in our streets in our major cities. We read about the corruption that is found in government and also in major corporations. And we are constantly being told about the coronavirus and how many are affected and how many are dying and how it is such a pandemic, not only in our nation, but throughout the entirety of the world. Horrible things. Happening. And folks, not only do we have horrible things happening, but you and I still must face the battles of our personal lives every day, don't we? Every day, you and I are having to deal with temptation. Satan is constantly enticing our desires, striving to do everything that he possibly can do to get us to serve him instead of God. We find, too, in these trying times that we oftentimes wake up being greatly discouraged, don't we? Things are not normal. Things are not natural. Things are changing, and that brings discouragement oftentimes to our hearts. Many individuals are facing various kinds of sicknesses, and there is even death, maybe even more so than in times past. We find that some are struggling with loneliness and others have their dreams that have been destroyed. They've set goals for themselves only to find that those goals are not going to come to pass. And there are some who have been forsaken by the unfaithfulness of other individuals. Individuals who are friends, individuals who are family, individuals who in times past could be trusted but yet have thrown them to the wind, so to speak, and made their lives much more difficult. You see, every one of us face our daily battles in addition to the evils and hardships that are in the world. And folks, when we focus on our hardships, sometimes we can forget what we have. You see, we focus on the negative rather than the positive, don't we? We focus on our struggles and all the difficulties that we are having rather than focusing upon our blessings. We focus on the hardships and we neglect to really focus upon what we have. For the next few moments, I want us to be encouraged. The title of our lesson very simply is this, What Do We Have? And we're going to be looking at seven answers to that question. What do we have, folks? Number one, you and I have the forgiveness of sins. There is a pandemic that is an effect that is affecting the entirety of the world. And that pandemic is not coronavirus. It is the pandemic and the disease of sin. And the disease of sin doesn't affect just a few here and there. It infects the entirety of the world, does it not? The writer of Ecclesiastes in Ecclesiastes 10 tells us that there is none on the earth that doeth good for all have sinned. Paul says basically the same thing, does he not, in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Think about that. There is a spiritual virus that is upon our earth and it is impacting every human being. 7.6 billion people and all of them will eventually contract the disease of sin. Fortunately, there is a remedy, isn't there? In fact, there is a cure and it is the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus says, for this is... The New Testament, in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Paul, when he wrote to the church at Colossae, in Colossians 1.14 tells us, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. John in the Apocalypse, Revelation 1.5 says, unto Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Yes, there is a pandemic of sin, but yet there is also a cure 
A way whereby all sin can be removed from our lives and we as Christians have appropriated that forgiveness in our life through Jesus' blood, haven't we? Folks, we are cleansed. And here's what's amazing to me. We stand blameless and guiltless before God. Notice what Paul writes in Colossians 1, or Colossians 3, yeah, 1, 21 through 23. Notice what he says, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled through the body of his flesh through death, that he may present you, notice this, holy and blameless and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature under heaven. Listen to those three words again. That He may present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight. Folks, when you and I are looked upon by God, He sees no sin. We have been cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. All of our iniquities, all of our transgressions, all of our sins have been removed. And now you and I can stand before God, guiltless and without sin. What a blessing. Cured from an evil disease. Point number two. What do we have Folks, you and I have a loving master, don't we? There was a time in our lives when every one of us were under the influence and control of a very evil taskmaster by the name of Satan, but no longer. We have one who bought us out from under that bondage, and now you and I are under servitude and slavery to a loving master, Jesus Christ. I find it interesting that we often talk about the fact that Jesus loved us. Did you hear the way I said that? Loved. As if His love was in the past. And there was that time when He loved us and gave Himself for us, wasn't it? Jesus Himself said, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. When Jesus died upon the cross of Calvary, yes, He manifested His love. He showed His love, how much He loves us. But folks, guess what? Jesus loves us right now. He loves us in the present tense, doesn't He? It's not that He loved us in the past. Yes, He did. But He also still loves us right now, today. We serve a loving Master. Now, there's many proofs of that, but we'll only talk about three. Number one, I know He loves me because He'll never leave me. Isn't that what the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 13, 5? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, Jesus says. Secondly, I know He loves me because He will intercede on my behalf. When I have sinned against the holy law of God, Jesus upon my repentance, upon my confession, will go right before the Father and beg and plead my case before Him based upon His blood. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Isn't it wonderful to know that you and I have somebody to stand between us and a holy God and beg for our forgiveness. He intercedes on our behalf. Why? Because He loves us, folks. And I know He loves me too because one of these days, He's coming back to get me. And He's going to come back to get you as well. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Yes, our Lord is gone, isn't He? He now is at the right hand of the throne of God, standing there in the presence of the Almighty God, but He will not stay there forever. One day, He's coming back for His people. You see, it lets me know that He wants me. Doesn't it you? 
Folks, He wants us to be able to live with Him forever and ever and ever. Why? Because He loves us. Point number two. What do we have? A loving Master. Point number three. What do we have? You and I have a royal law, don't we? We have a law that governs us, that guides us, that directs us in every aspect of our lives. Note this. It is a holy law and perfect because it was given by God Himself. For the law of the Lord is perfect. Psalm 19, verse 7. Folks, there are no flaws, there are no errors, there are no contradictions, there are no problems whatsoever in the law of the Almighty God. And those who follow it have blessings untold at their disposal. The psalmist in Psalm 119, verses 1 and 2 says this, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk Listen to him in the law of God. Notice those two words. Blessed and walk. If I walk in God's law, I will be blessed. Verse 2. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and who seek him with a whole heart. Again, blessings upon those who do the will of the Almighty God. James tells us about the Royal law, the perfect law of liberty in James 1 verse 25. And he tells us that if we keep that law, being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be, again, listen to the word, blessed in his deed. John writes in the Revelation, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. Blessed is the one who walks in the law of God. Blessed is the one who keeps the testimonies. Blessed are they that keep the word of God. Blessed are those who obey the commandments of God. Folks, you and I are showered with blessings because we keep God's word. We have a holy word at our disposal. Point number four. What do we have, folks? We have a holy work to be involved in. You see, the Lord's church has a work that the Lord has given us to complete, hasn't He? When we talk about that work, usually we refer to it as soul-saving and evangelism. When I stand before you and I preach and I say, today I'm going to preach to you about evangelism. Or I say, today I'm going to preach to you about soul-saving. You go, oh, here He goes. It's almost like we turn it off, don't we? Soul-saving and evangelism. Folks, that's not the way we need to look at that. So what I want us to do this morning for just a moment is, I want us to look at soul-saving and evangelism from two other perspectives. It's the same thing, but it's just looking at it in a different way. First, you and I have a work to do in the vineyard of the Lord, don't we? For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which was a householder, which went out early in the morning, listen to him, to hire laborers into his vineyard. There we are. Folks, you and I are laborers in the vineyard of God. Kathleen and I had the privilege of going to California last summer. And we went through vineyard land out in California. Stopped at one and visited it. Folks, what a beautiful area of the country. A vineyard on this hillside, a vineyard on that hillside, and guess what? Perfectly kept. Trimmed. All weeds removed from underneath those vines. No disease. No bugs. You see, individuals are laboring every day trying to make those vines produce to the utmost of their ability. Why? Because they want an abundant harvest, don't they? 
Folks, what are we doing? Folks, we are planting the seed of the Word of God into the hearts of men in order to bring forth a vineyard, aren't we? See, that's our purpose. To labor in the vineyard of God. Yes, plant the seed, watch it grow up, care for it, nurture it, protect it from all enemies and adversaries. And guess what? Eventually, you and I will have a wonderful crop to harvest. You see, it's a different way of looking at it than just calling it soul saving or evangelism. No, we are bringing forth an abundant crop for the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's a second way to look at it. We have a building to build, folks. And the building that you and I are building is the very temple of the Almighty God. I want you to think back for a minute. Just transport yourself back to the days of Solomon. Solomon was given the responsibility of building the temple of God in the city of Jerusalem, wasn't he? Question. Would you have liked to have been a laborer on that workforce? Oh, I would have. Here's an individual who is given the privilege of being able to build the very house of the living God. I built the stones. I laid the stones. I cut the wood. I did all of the intricate artwork in that beautiful temple. I am the one who prepared the curtain. I am the one who overlaid it with gold. I am the individual who helped to erect the temple of God. And look at it. What a beautiful place it is. And I had a part of that. Wouldn't that have been something to brag about? I was a builder of the temple of God. Paul says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. There you go. Paul was looking at it from the standpoint of a vineyard. But then he says this. Ye are God's building. Now listen to verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 3. According to the grace which was given unto me as a wise master builder, I laid the foundation. And another man buildeth thereon. He concludes the verse with these words. So let every man beware how he buildeth thereupon. Those words include Victor Eskew. My friends, you and I are building the temple of God. Not a literal temple, but a spiritual temple, are we not? A temple that is grander and more magnificent. In fact, it's the real temple. That temple in Jerusalem was just a shadow. That temple in Jerusalem was just a type of real temple. It was not the very image. It was not the substance, folks. You and I are building the literal temple of God. And how do we do it? Stone at a time. Peter said, ye also as lively stones. You see, every Christian is a stone in the temple. You and I, when we go out and we convert someone to Christ, we are adding lively or living stones to the house of God. I have the opportunity to stand back and say, I am a builder of the temple of the Almighty God. You see, you and I have a holy work to complete, don't we? And folks, what a wonderful work it is. Oh yes, it's soul saving and that's important. But it is growing the vineyard of God. It is erecting the temple of the Almighty God. What a work we have been charged to do. Fifth, we have a reservoir of blessings, do we not? I find it interesting we often use Ephesians 1-3 to talk about the importance of being in Christ. And there's no doubt that it is vital to be in Christ because that's where 
all spiritual blessings are. But see, we also need to emphasize the fact that we have, as Christians, those who are in Christ, we have all spiritual blessings. Note this. All spiritual blessings are in Him. What does that mean? That means there are none that we do not have. They build dams on rivers, don't they? And when they build that dam, what happens? The waters back up, don't they? And they form a reservoir. Sometimes they refer to it as a huge lake. And that beautiful lake is there as a reservoir of water for those who are in the community and downstream, aren't they? And they can use that reservoir of water for many things. For their benefit. God has given us a reservoir of blessings to use in our life. And they are all where in Christ where all of us are. Did a little research. One writer says that there are 15 spiritual blessings from Ephesians 1, 4 to Ephesians 1, verse 20. Now remember, all spiritual blessings are where? In Christ. And then what does Paul do? Paul lists 15 blessings that are there. we got a lot of preaching to do, don't we? Just look at them real quickly. He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Notice secondly, we are holy and blameless before God. Thirdly, we are in His love. Folks, what a better place to be than in the love of the Almighty God. We have received the adoption of children. Oh no, you and I were not physically born into the family of God as was Jesus, but you and I have been adopted by God into His family. We are accepted in the blood, Paul says. We have redemption. That is, we've been bought out of that slavery and now we are the servants of Jesus. We have the forgiveness of sins, he says. Notice he also talks about the riches of the grace of God that's in our lives. You and I have the privilege of knowing the mystery. If I were to ask you, what is the mystery of God in one word? What would you say? You ready? Ready? church. That's the mystery of God. You see, the church was in the mind of God even before the foundation of the world. Now, somebody say, well, it ought to be Jesus. Well, folks, you cannot separate Jesus from the church, can you? Jesus is the head, the church is the body. Jesus died, shed His blood in order to do what? Purchase the church. The church is the eternal plan of God and you and I know the mystery. It's there that He unites all men into one fellowship, doesn't He? We also read that we have an eternal inheritance. We've heard the truth. Can you imagine? There are individuals in the world who have never heard the truth. You and I have, haven't we? Because we're in Christ. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We have hope beyond this world. We have a rich inheritance. And lastly, folks, God has given unto us magnificent power through our Lord and Savior. Fifteen blessings found where? In Christ. I found another website. And guess what? The writer presented 78 blessings on that website that are found in Jesus. We're going to be here till 6 o'clock now. Now that website's in my notes. I didn't put it up here. And I'm not covering all 76. In fact, I'm not going to cover any of them. And you go, oh, thank the Lord. 76 blessings, folks. Most individuals, if you were to ask them, how many blessings are in Christ? Oh, maybe two or three. No, 76, he says. And I don't even know if he got them all, do you? Folks, you and I have a reservoir of blessings from the Almighty God. That's what we have. And sometimes we forget that, don't we? How about this next one? Victory over death. Folks, death is a reality, isn't it? 
is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment, Hebrews 9.27. And every now and then, that reality is driven home by the death of a loved one, isn't it? We've had some even within this congregation recently. I find it interesting that Paul refers to death as an enemy. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 27. It's an enemy. Some might ask, well, why is it an enemy? Well, there's many reasons. Number one, it ends our life here. Doesn't it? And we are no longer free to enjoy the things that we enjoy on this earth. I don't know about you occasionally, I like to go out to a restaurant and eat. Kind of hard in COVID, in some places anyway. You die, that's gone. I enjoy going and visit my grandkids. That first few minutes is unbelievable, isn't it? Granddad, granddad, granddad. You die, that's gone. It brings all of our efforts to an end. You know, there's some individuals in this audience who are working hard in life to do various things, aren't they? Provide for your family, build a business, whatever it might be. You're working and you're laboring and you're toiling just as hard as you can. And you die and guess what? doesn't matter whether it's 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years of labor. It's over. All efforts halt. It ends our earthly relationships, don't it? We all called Kathleen's mom, Nona. That's the Italian word for grandmother. There is no more visiting Nona. You see, she's gone. It ends earthly relationships. It brings sorrow of heart, doesn't it? Folks, death breaks our heart. Charles Spurgeon says that it embitters our existence. And how true that is, doesn't it? We find, too, that death rots and decays the body. It parts us from our earthly possessions. Oh yes, they'll dress you up and make you look beautiful in that casket, but guess what? It will not go with you to heaven, will it? You open up that casket 20 years from now, and guess what? Those clothes will still be right there. Nothing that you own goes with you beyond, oh no, it's divided up among others in this world, isn't it? And guess what? It harms individuals who are little bitty to those who are of great age, doesn't it? There have been some who have died just moments after conception. I read the other day on Facebook a mother pleading for the life of her little four-year-old who had contracted cancer, begging for prayers that she live. Ten-year-olds, fifteen-year-olds, twenty-year-olds, thirty, forty. And then there's those that are eighty, ninety. Some go even beyond a hundred years of age. But guess what? Death impacts all individuals at some point. Death is an enemy. And my friends, in Christ Jesus, we have victory, don't we? We have victory. Just look at a few passages. Jesus says... All that are in the grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth. Who do you put in a grave? The dead folks. Who's coming out of the grave? Dead folks. You see, there's victory over death. John 5, 28 and 29. The Apostle Paul, standing before the Jewish council, said in Acts chapter 23, verse 15, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead. We lay that body down in the grave. But the word resurrection means stand again. That body that was laid down will stand again, resurrected, victorious over death. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, When we shall have put off this corruption and put on incorruption, and when we shall have put off mortality and put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, 
death is swallowed up in victory. You see, one day, corruption ends and incorruption begins. Mortality ceases and guess what? Immortality is ours to enjoy. Death is swallowed up in victory. Paul says in Philippians 3 verse 21, Who shall change our vile bodies? And folks, aren't they vile sometimes? They hurt, they ache, they break. They get scraped, they get diseased. They get sick. Our vile bodies. But one of these days, our vile bodies is going to be changed. And look what it's going to be changed into. That it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, our Lord possesses a spiritual body just like you and I will have one of these days. Paul says, And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Can you imagine? Oh, we think it's wonderful to live, don't we? Folks, it's better to be dead in Christ. Because guess what? When our Lord comes again, you'll be the first to see Him. Isn't that wonderful? The dead in Christ shall rise first. You and I have victory over death. Yes, death is horrible. Yes, it's an enemy. But guess what? In Christ, you and I have victory over death. We don't have anything to fear. That leads to point seven. What do we have? A hope that lies beyond. Can you imagine being an atheist? Evolutionist. One who says there is no God. You've got no reason to exist. Find you a good atheist sometime and just ask him this question. What is your purpose here? You don't know. You don't have a purpose. Eat, drink, live and die. That's his purpose. Wow. But how about this? Can you imagine not having any expectation of living beyond this life? Eat, drink, and be merry. Why? For tomorrow we die. Here's a person who wakes up every day. He has no purpose for living. And the only thing he has to look forward to is being dropped into a hole or burned Through cremation. What kind of an existence is that? Folks, that's not the Christian. The Christian has hope after death, does he not? We have purpose here, but we also have hope beyond this life. And we could talk for a long period of time about what constitutes our hope. There is the hope of the second coming. There's the hope of the resurrection from the dead. There's the hope of a glorified body. There is a hope of heaven and there is a hope of eternal life. Kathleen's mom lived about three weeks shy of 96. That's a long life, isn't it? But guess what? We as Christians, regardless of when we die, when we come out of the grave, we will never, 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 never die again. Eternal life is ours. I find it interesting that the Bible talks about the fact that we have an expectation of hope. Folks, hope's not something we have right now from the standpoint of we have the actual reality of it. But we're looking forward to it in the days ahead. Galatians 5 verse 5. We also learn that we rejoice in that hope, don't we? Oh yes, we go to the grave and we go so and we do so with great tears and sorrow and sadness, but we can walk away with a smile on our face. Why? We know that's not the end. We rejoice in our hope, don't we? The Bible tells us that our hope is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Hebrews 6, verse 19. I'm glad I've got hope, don't you? In fact, the Bible even says that we are saved by that hope. If it weren't for that hope, we might give up, mightn't we? Our hope is a lively or living hope. 
Because Jesus rose from the dead. Because Jesus is alive, I know that one day I too will live again. It is a living, lively hope. And lastly, it will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine hearing the sound of our Lord's voice? The dirt of that grave boiling forth from the earth. And you coming out of that grave to meet Jesus and to live with Him forever and ever. Folks, that is hope, isn't it? You know, we're living in some pretty terrible times. There's no doubt about that. I get so sick of it that I just turn off the TV now. Don't even want to hear about it. But, folks, let's not focus solely on all the bad that's going on in the world or maybe even in our lives because you see, there are some things we do have. So let's remember the things that we do have and let's make those things motivate us and move us to continue to live a life of faithfulness here on this earth. Now here's something that's interesting. Those blessings are only for the Christian. That's all. If you are not a Christian, if you are not a child of God, if you are not a faithful Christian, folks, those blessings are not yours. You need to become a Christian today. The steps are simple, aren't they? Hear the Word of God. Believe in the Christ as the Son of God. Repent of sins. Confess the sweet name of Jesus and be immersed in water, baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Those are the initial steps. But Paul also says this, God will present us what? Holy, blameless, and righteous if we continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. There's an if there. I've got to be faithful. I've got to be steadfast. I've got to keep living as a Christian ought to live. You be faithful unto death... He'll give you a crown of life. You need to respond to the invitation to become a Christian. Maybe to repent of sins and confess them and ask God to forgive you as a Christian. You need to respond as together we stand and sing.